This episode is brought to you by Bumble. Who says Valentine's Day is just for couples? Just because you're not in a relationship doesn't mean you can't get out there and live your best love life. That's where Bumble comes in. This February 14th, you can flip the script and give those relationshipers a friendly dose of FOMO. Say no to staying in this Valentine's Day and yes to more. More dates, more first kisses, more gossip for the group chat girlies. Do Valentine's your way. Date now on Bumble. Melanie, what can the problem be? Sweet Melanie, why won't you go out with me? She lived across the street. All right, Matt, I am very excited right now because not only are we going to talk about what I think is one of Al's best originals, but we're going to be talking about it with one of my favorite people in music and also one of the only people I know who has a song about them by another band that I love. So, <laughs> so of Nerve Herder song title fame, we have Allie Gertz here. Hello. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Stoked to be here. Yeah. And uh, obviously the nerve herder of it all is they put out Born to be Weird like the week that we started recording this episode. <laughs> Incredible. Uh, That's right. I forgot about that. That was weird timing. Yeah. <laughs> it was funny when um, uh, before I knew that they had a song that was going to literally be my first and last name, they had <laughs> revealed that they were going to do a song called The Girl Who Listened to Rush. And I joked on Twitter saying like, is this song about me? And they're like, just wait. <laughs> It's amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. <Yeah. laughs> so we have talked about this on a past episode, Ali, that there's a handful of songs by Al where specifically like the chorus and the structure of it, we said like it dangerously walks the line of just being an Alfred Yankovic song and not like a weird <laughs> like like it's so close to a normal radio pop song <laughs> that it almost yeah falls out of being like a parody in style uh, or a style parody. And man, this chorus is so good. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I bet that if you played this for a lot of people, they would not guess that this was a Weird Al song. Yeah. If you showed it to a non-Weird Al fan, which why would you ever talk to someone like that? <laughs> <laughs> I definitely think that they would be surprised genuinely because the lyrics are are clever but they're also not you know they're not i don't know you could you could just get so into the hook that you might yeah. not even notice the lyrics having this story and humor and aspect to them i think the only line that would theoretically take you out of it is the uh, mohawk to the cat that's yeah. exactly what i was gonna that's say the yeah. one line that is kind of a little bit tipping the hat into i'm doing comedy yeah i i wrote down that like let me find the i, I wrote the song is unique for al because the verses are obviously insane but the chorus is so terrifyingly normal that it could be sang <laughs> by any jangle pop band of the 80s and 90s like this could be a del armitri chorus uh. with like no <laughs> questions like well like, i think that's part of what makes the song really effective too is that the chorus is so so hooky so catchy and so on the surface somewhat inoffensive that <laughs> it's burying the lead of what this person's actually talking about in these verses you're you're he's yeah you're hiding the the actual like more sinister intentions of this character in the song but going back to the the first thing we were talking about i have done this before with this track i feel like for someone who i have met who um, I've done it a couple times, people who like Al but don't know his solo stuff very well or only into the parodies. And I think this is about as good as you can get for an entry point song of just like Al is also a songwriter. And if you just want to play someone a song that he wrote that I think is hard to not enjoy, this ranks pretty high. 100%. Yeah. And this was, we, we briefly touched on this when we were recording the episode for Stuck in a Closet with Vanna White, but this was... That song and Melanie were the first two songs recorded for Even Worse. Mm. And I was saying in that episode, you couldn't have two dramatically different songs in the sense of like <laughs> yeah. this rock and roll song where every single lyric is abstract and weird and bizarre. Where like, if you told me, knowing like the weird way that Al can insert his personal life into his comedic songs... I almost wonder if the original chorus, like that the chorus stem from like 
a genuine song he was writing about someone that he was interested in that didn't reciprocate. And then he was like, this hook is too good. What's the most insane way that I can write verses <laughs> around this chorus? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah, it, it sounds like a Matthew Sweet song to me. Mm. Like, yes. I know apparently I, when I was reading about it, I think that there was more of a like connection to like Tom Petty, which I hear. But like uh, to me, it's like very much Matthew Sweet. But yeah, I, I don't know. I saw that too. The the Weird Al fandom wiki page or whatever said that it was a style parody of Tom Petty, and I I mean I, don't I get guess, it. but no, like uh, they also I, th- I think that's a that's a speculative parody. I don't think Al has ever specifically said that this was a reference to a particular artist or other song. Sometimes he's very clear about that, and I don't think sure. if there's any reference to it, I have not found it anywhere. If this is you know taking from anything in particular, I just feel like if it if he had a Tom Petty style song we'd it'd be much more discernible than this yeah, you know yeah. he's, he's so usually way more clear it. exactly yeah, yeah exactly absolutely. he'd be singing it with a tom petty voice he exactly. doesn't do anything like that yeah no no this yeah. is just genuinely a great jangle pop yeah number yeah. yeah and and i'm i mean this is a call between three people who i think would all put ourselves as like genuine tom petty fans mm-hmm. yes. so like if we can't sniff out a tom, <laughs> yeah. a tom petty style parody in this then i definitely doubt al was going for that yeah yeah right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Influence maybe, but definitely sure. not. Yeah, totally. The the lyrics as I was like listening to this for like the fifth, sixth, seventh time today, and like reading the lyrics. Love that Spotify just has the lyrics rolling now with the, the songs best. is such a beautiful feature. The best. <laughs> but as I was reading it, you know, people make fan edit music videos constantly to their favorite Al songs that didn't get a video. And I'm I'm throwing this out there because I don't really have the bandwidth or time to do this. But if someone wants to just take scenes from you on Netflix <laughs> with Joe and just make a music video out of Joe being creepy, uh, I think you could make it work. I'm just <laughs> just pitching that out there right now. I haven't watched that show. Should I? No. <laughs> Maybe the first Great. season. Uh, Great. But Perfect. It, it falls apart pretty quickly <laughs> after that. But <laughs> uh, just. God, this song is so. Let's start with this, Allie. When we when we reached out to you about doing the show, you had sent us like a couple songs you wanted to talk about, and you had called out specifically that this. You were like, I really would like to talk about Melanie above yeah. all, if possible, which was great because we were just about to start recording the episodes for this album. What is it about this song that you were like, this is the one? Uh, we've touched on it already, but just the fact that. You know, okay, so I, I'll, I'll say for people who don't know my music at all, um, which I imagine there are a fair few of you, um, I do songs that can be categorized as comedy. But really, first and foremost, I'm writing melodies and trying to come up with interesting, you know, hooks and guitar. And the lyrics really are something that I hope that you don't need to appreciate in order to appreciate the song that I do. Mm-hmm. And uh, that said, I do put a lot of care and time into my songs about Millhouse and tromboners and stuff <laughs> like that. But, you know, first and foremost, I really try to approach my music, you know, musically. It sounds obvious, but that's really not always the case with music comedy where lyrics are often, you know, center stage. Yeah. And so it just is one of those songs that I think was always in the back of my mind in terms of influence um, for what I do. And, uh, you know, I listened to a ton of Dr. Demento as a kid and like I loved Weird Al growing up. Um, And that was always a song that, you know, this song doesn't make a kid laugh. (laughs) Like it's just, you know, it's not necessarily something that's easy to understand in the way that like, you know, Eat It is funny. Um, (laughs) You know, he's in in comparison to other stuff that I would have liked as a kid, it would have maybe gone over my head. But because I loved I grew up with like, you know, the Beatles and Jellyfish and like all these other bands like it just was a good song and it just is something that always stuck out to me as as a classic and i actually saw him do it live at a show not too long ago and i was so happy because i wasn't sure if i wasn't sure how popular this song actually even is even amongst weird al fans but he was doing that tour where he was doing like all originals and it was so exciting i saw him on that tour and he did this song as well and and with the just everyone dropping into the acapella vocal Uh, intro was just this moment of like oh my god this is the best the best it's blissful. Yeah, yeah it really it's is. joyous. Well, and I, you know, I get that connection as a as a huge fan of your music. Like there are songs of yours that, yes, I definitely laugh and they're silly. But there's just as many songs, especially on your first album, that actually made me tear up and cry because Aww, you could tell that they you. were from a personal place. And I mean that. Like, open letter to myself is such a beautiful 
relatable song to anybody. And I think I've messaged you about this years ago, like the very first time that you and I met that like, if you, even if you didn't know Freaks and Geeks, a song like Good Kid is just a nice pop song. And thank you. And well, but I I get that vibe here with with Melanie too. It's like it's just a good pop song. Regard like remove what the words are, the melody and and the emotion. There there feels like a genuine emotion in the yeah. chorus in a way that you don't actually get in a lot of like so many of the Al songs have that like sarcastic snark to it. But this chorus feels so sincere when it's yeah. sung. That's <laughs> yeah. that's what I was saying. That's what I love about it. Again, the chorus is so sincere alongside these verses where this guy is just insane i would <laughs> I know. that's the comedy of the song <laughs> yeah. in its own way i feel like that's what yeah, makes it funny yeah, yeah yeah totally and according yeah, to and al there's a ton of other verses that will never see the light of day. i was just gonna say <laughs> I, I i pulled that from uh, apparently he wrote it in the uh it was it's in the liner notes to the permanent record box set from many years ago no and, way and al says a quote sometimes this song has an alternate verse that I only sing to my friends. <laughs> and he also notes that M Melanie is one of the very few songs he has that if it became a movie might be rated PG-13. <laughs> so, uh, nice, I also read that he did ominous. in fact live in the Gilmore building for a while when he wrote this song. Wow, so it is autobiographical. <laughs> I, I think he changed it slightly. Apparently it's called the Gailmore building oh, in yes, LA. He so he switched it very slightly. He but was yes, covering his tracks. I know, right? So we would never, little did he know how much research we would do <laughs> <laughs> yes i'm sure in 1988 he said as long as there's not a podcast that meticulously exactly. breaks down all of my songs exactly. i'll get away with this scot yeah. free <laughs> um uh, to talk a little bit more about that kind of like comedy versus music um thing mm. it, it is interesting just because like you know we're in a really amazing weird owl um appreciation decade right now and it's great but there was like a period of time where like he wasn't, you know, as as getting all the appreciation that he deserves on a daily basis as he should. And I think that there was just like not as much music comedy happening anymore or it was just being overwrought by like YouTube parodies immediately like the song would come out and like everybody did it and it was like oversaturated maybe. Um, and in those moments, it's kind of interesting to look back on the catalog and be like, you know, he didn't have to be funny. He could have just been this really talented dude. But it's funny because... I, you know, I, in my own sets and my own performances, I often will get a compliment from someone um, that is unfortunately backhanded, but they mean well of like, you know, you could be a real musician if you wanted to. Oof. And I know exactly what they're saying. They're saying like, you don't have to hide behind this gimmick that is writing about pop culture or, you know, doing whatever. For me, like, I write the songs I write uh, because I understand cartoon feelings better than my own sometimes. And it's just a little bit easier for me to dig into someone else's experience than my own at times. But I think that when I do, like I have one song on my first album that is just about my dad. And it's like, I don't even remember what it's called, but it is just about my dad. And then another song that is just about a breakup. And like, no one ever requests those songs, but those songs helped me flesh out in my mind. Like I could if I wanted to. And I mm. prefer to do this. And I love that these songs exist, but that, like, listen, if, if Al did, did never made a joke again, I'd be very sad. But mm. I would also eagerly buy whatever album he made. <laughs> um, but it's cool when someone is able to show you, like, yeah, I can do this. Um, and I choose to continue what I like to do. And I like that you get to have both things existing at once. Absolutely, yeah. Well, I think I, it's I, in, I was going to say, there's that Sparks Brothers documentary. And I think Al specifically makes the comment in it where he's like, Unfortunately, when you're funny, people don't think that you can be serious. Yeah. And yeah. and there is this aspect of like why I think about that all the time. And we want to like hold these things to a certain weird standard where it's like, well, why can't a comedy be the best picture of that year? Like can't Absolutely. like I have been emotionally moved by episodes of The Simpsons just as much as any drama. Like <laughs> more, like, more so. More so. Yeah. You know, like there's. I, I talk about the importance of comedy in even like horror. I think that when you have comedic beats in a horror movie, it successfully lulls people into that feeling of security for the scares to be more effective. I, comedy. You have to. Yeah, comedy is so crucial in getting to any of that. I, yeah. If you just made a dramatic movie, if you made a dramatic movie that was like the way Team America depicts um, rent, right? Where it's just like, 
super sad and everybody has AIDS and like that's the whole like <laughs> like it wouldn't be effective you'd be like yeah. you just go in knowing that it's going to be sad and dreary and just that's it but like having those moments of brightness and and comedy makes the real shit more effective because <laughs> you've totally. opened your heart more to it yeah and you also have to be I mean, not all the time, but you have to be very smart in order to understand what's funny about a situation. So, yes. you know what I mean? Like, you have to understand tragedy and sadness in order to find the humor in it. The fact that this song, you know, is about a serious topic, which yeah. is stalking somebody. Yeah. No, I <laughs> was going like, to say that this creep is and uh, very, uh, like, in a, invasively stalking. Oh, it's super creepy. <laughs> yeah. I would say this is a great example of, like, Al as a songwriter but if we're going to talk about it through the lens of comedy he yes. really occupies all this different space where he can be so broad and so subtle like this is a very subtle piece of comedy in this track we talked yes. about that on dog eat dog which is another song that on its on paper is not that funny like there's really not many jokes or and coming up soon on this record a song like velvet elvis which is not that like there's not jokes in that song in the same way it's more like shining a light on these like odd idiosyncrasies of our culture <laughs> yes. uh, completely and it's it, and it's not and then he'll also have a song about like eating too much food which is also <laughs> fine like he can do it all like he's he's exploring the entire space um, and I love the fact that yeah some things are outwardly funny and some things are just like oh it's not that funny and yet oddly feels completely appropriate on this album of comedy songs <laughs> like you no one would think this song didn't fit on this record correct yeah, yeah. It's so there's a lyric that I want to look at and analyze for a second because I think it's another one of those ways that Al can take the way that Al sings a line helps cover up the seriousness mm -hmm. <laughs> of the line. And it's the line that jumps out at me every time I listen to it, which is when he very beautifully sings, I'm certain that our love would last forever and ever, or are you too dumb to realize that? And that song, very funny. I'm sure that there are a ton of people who have unfortunately experienced a real life situation where someone is yelling at them. Oh my like, God. are you too dumb to realize we're perfect together? And yeah. I, I think Al realizing that and like juxtapo like taking what is a very threatening, scary thing that someone could say to you in a position of power and singing it in this like happy jangle pop sound right before he goes into this earwormy chorus is like, that's not accidental. That no. is very well thought out <laughs> oh, and yeah. put in there. <laughs> this is an early, I mean, he is, we're in the mid to late eighties and this is, uh, he will do this again, but this is really a song about toxic masculinity. And, and it's an early song about like, I mean, you could, in, in nowadays we would probably strongly consider referring to the main character of this song as some sort of an incel. Yeah. I mean, some of the language he uses and the, the behavior and the attitude, I, this is rough. Yeah. And again, it's that funny thing of like, it's a comedy song and a lot of these sentiments are not funny. This is not funny. And it's, it's about the delivery and the juxtaposition and the message that he's getting across with this character. That is what makes this like actually work kind of against a lot of odds. I think at this point, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's playing yeah, with a the, traditionally not funny topic and exactly. making it work. Yeah, the pitch is hard. Like the pitch <laughs> yeah. for the song is difficult. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It really is. Yeah, check out this song. It's great. It's a love song from a potentially crazy stalker who definitely commits suicide at the end of the story. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, and you know, uh, another foreshadowing moment, but this is another, like, this album ends on good old days which is another song i bet about a very problematic dude and it's like al is starting at this point in his career this is getting more and more a thing and it's they're going to continue to pop up these songs about these characters uh exhibiting some of the worst aspects of american culture and, <laughs> and uh attitude in a way this uh in a way, this song is actually kind of like the counterpart to uh, Eminem's Stan. <laughs> like, yes. when you think about it, it's actually very, very much the same storyline. Yeah, You're right. I, it's absolutely true. We try, for the most part, and I think we mostly succeed, we try to, to take these songs through not the lens of what we know of 30 years of Al, but like, all right, 1988, like we're thinking about this from that lens. But I, I do want to draw comparisons. The only other song that I can think of and I'm sure both of you will come up with other ones, but that have this similar format where it's got this earwormy chorus that doesn't 
draw attention to the comedy and could work as just a straight pop chorus, but is like much darker and sinister in the lyrics of the verses is like, I remember Larry on bad hair day, Mm. like has a very similar thing where it's got this super catchy chorus that doesn't really hint at anything comedic in it, but it's the verses that lead into that poppy chorus (laughs) that like, yeah, Sell it. it's less it's less poppy, but good old days does do a similar thing. Like I yeah. was saying, that's the whole joke of it is that those were the good old days. And then the verses are this guy just ruined, like burning down his town <laughs> as a child. And again, we'll get into that later. But but um, yeah, it, and that song's not as hooky. That's a more like the folky arrangement yeah. of it. But uh, it's definitely a, a, a theme that he will he he loves to come back to these like really like horrible characters and let them speak there their mind for a while something that i think that um maybe passing weird al fans don't really understand about weird al's comedy is like he's kind of funniest when he's being mean like he's very mean (laughs) in his in his in his fake interviews like in his characters in uhf like there's always moments where he's really biting and oddly you know he kind of reminds me of um you know characters that have come before and after him, like Mickey Mouse and SpongeBob are both characters that are kind of similar to Al in that like when not understood well, they're seen as kind of like just this kid friendly thing. And really like there's so much more depth to both of these. Like Mickey Mouse was kind of a jerk (laughs) as is SpongeBob at times, as is Al at times. And like they get softened in their recreations or in kind of like retellings of them or when they're only kind of thought of as their biggest hits. But like, Mm -hmm. To me, the things that are always the most interesting and, and I don't know, dynamic are like how how rude, <laughs> I guess, they could be. Because like yeah. there's an edge to Al that I think that unless you know Al's work well, maybe you didn't know. No, I think you're absolutely right. I love that because we had talked on this show early on about how, uh, it's funny because it's come up a lot despite it being so obscure, that very early on he did the song It's Still Billy Joel to Me where he's making fun of Billy Joel Mm -hmm. and he wound up not recording it because he was like, this feels too mean. And I think in that, that's an important distinction where it's because like it's him making fun of Billy Joel's music. Yes. That's mean to Al in a way that he doesn't like, but making, making fun of the type of person who would do this in this song that he has no problem (laughs) drilling home the idea that this person (laughs) deserves to be laughed at (laughs) for being like this. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Well, I also like that there's like a level. I know that he's singing from the perspective of a character in a lot of these, but like, um, you know, this song doesn't come out for much later. I'm not sure how off the if I'm breaking the rules here, but mm. my other favorite original song is his Ben Folds song. Why does this always happen to me? Yeah, which not just also has he been mentions brought, the Simpsons. Yeah. We have brought <laughs> but, this up a couple times on the show really? because it yeah. fits. It's phenomenal. It fits a very. I, I think that that, well, A, I love Ben Fold, so that's going to go a long way. So but, much. So good. But I think that that fits, uh, we, we refer to like the genre of songs that he does, because he has these very distinct buckets, right? There's mm-hmm. like food songs. There's, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And I think Why Does This Always Happen to Me is probably his best example of a specific type of song that he writes, which is natural catastrophes being treated as minor inconveniences and minor inconveniences <laughs> being treated as na- like national crisis. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> it's very relatable yeah. in a oh, weird yeah, way. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah like first world problem type songs. Totally. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the entitlement that exists in both of those songs is different. One of them is entitlement to another human. Um, Mm. and the other one is entitlement to things always going your way. Um, but it's just, I don't know, those songs really parallel each other or complement each other really well. Um, they do different things similarly and they're both so catchy. Yeah. So catchy. TIAA is on a mission. Why? Because 54% of black Americans don't have enough savings to retire. So in collaboration with big name artists like Wyclef Jean, TIAA released Paper Right, new music inspiring a new financial future. With 100% of streaming sales going to a nonprofit that teaches students how to invest. Stream Paper Right now and help close the gap. This episode is brought to you by Bumble. Who says Valentine's Day is just for couples? Just because you're not in a relationship doesn't mean you can't get out there and live your best love life. That's where Bumble comes in. 
This February 14th, you can flip the script and give those relationshipers a friendly dose of FOMO. Say no to staying in this Valentine's Day and yes to more. More dates, more first kisses, more gossip for the group chat girlies. Do Valentine's your way. Date now on Bumble. 91 Donkey Lane is a magical apartment complex that contains immense power but lacks intelligent inhabitants. What is happening? I'm getting texts. Why are we getting a lot of texts? People found out what we did. Oh, dividing Mike Myers into an infinite amount of tiny Mike Myers. Listen to 91 Donkey Lane for free on Spotify or your favorite podcasting app. More at 91donkeylane.com. See you there, you donkeys. Something I noticed in this, and I don't think the timing of this works out, but it was funny. We talked just a couple episodes ago about... Uh, I think I'm a clone now, which is a parody of the Tiffany song. And Tiffany dealt with stalkers mm. big time. Now, I don't think the timing of this works out, but I thought, I'm like, oh, wow, Tiffany dealt with stalkers. And it's not hard to envision a scenario where Tiffany and Melanie are interchangeable names. Sure. <laughs> in a song <laughs> like this. I, 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 don't, I don't think that the timing <laughs> of this works out in my favor, but I like to pretend that I've just uncovered a massive conspiracy and that this song was really <laughs> Al's message to Tiffany of understanding. And I'm like, I'm sorry you're going through this with these, with these crazy, crazy men. Well, it's interesting too, because like Al is obviously such a good kind person. Like I, I often think about how he will absolutely be the only person to never get canceled in the world. Like yeah. he's the only person where it's coming for all of us guys. But, um, <laughs> it's just Al a matter of a, time. <laughs> yeah. Al is such a good person. Um, that there's not even a question that this is satire, you know, exactly. when he has these characters, but so often, especially, it feels like especially right now, we're in a drought of people having understanding for um, the anti-hero and, mm -hmm. and satire, and there's a difficulty from, it just seems like more and more people are not understanding that the main character of a thing um, can and should be flawed and sometimes awful. Um, and I feel like, I wonder if there's anybody who might listen to this song who doesn't know Al, who's just like, they shouldn't be making this character stalk people. Stalking people's bad. <laughs> I, I'm really glad you brought that up. So two <laughs> things. One, we talked recently about how I was saying, I think it's an interesting thing in music that specifically music, people have a really hard time with the idea that the person who is singing something is not singing from their own perspective. Oh, yeah. The idea that they are telling a story. It's just like when you watch a film or you read a book, you're not with the person who made it. They're behind right. the scenes. But with music, it's just this. it feels so personal that you can't wrap your head around the fact that it's fiction that you're yes. hearing them say. Mm -hmm. um, so that completely jives. I totally agree with you. That's a weird thing people have. But also... <laughs> Um, I did find pretty recently on the Vanity Tour, it was someone who went to see him who wrote an article talking about how that they felt uncomfortable at a show that was specifically they shouted out Melanie and good old days. And one that was really surprised me. Uh, oh, oh um, uh, close but no cigar as songs that they didn't feel great about because they were making light of serious subjects. That's and, so interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they made a point at the very end in the last paragraph, because and this cracked me up, was, are these songs actually just a critique of our culture? I suppose that case could be made. <laughs> but that so is, they a, do that is get at the it. end of an incredibly long <laughs> rant about how, how problematic this is. It was like, wait a minute. Like, you obviously get it. And it's just like... I, I can understand that for some people, like even in the context of satire, even if they know it's satire, they can be like, I still don't want to hear it. And I guess that's your prerogative. If that's how you feel about it, that's fine. But misunderstanding satire as sincere is right. a really dangerous game to get into for, for all of us. Because satire can be so powerful when it's done correctly, which I would argue this song does. Yeah, it's so interesting. I mean, it's obviously such a big topic and yeah. easy to go down that rabbit hole, but you know, you think of what the alternative would be, which, you know, if if we're not relying on satire to make comments, it would have to be very literal and yeah. finding a way to like making, how do you make a song that's boring calls out? Yes. Cause you're <laughs> not just interesting, be like, you know? Uh, yeah. Stalking is stupid and I don't <laughs> think you should do it. Like yeah. what? <laughs> how is then, that funny? Cause then the listener just feels <laughs> like they're being like they're in school and it's yeah. like, that's not yeah. fun to hear. Well, yeah. the, the thing that, the thing that it comes down to, and this is like with any creative s endeavor is like, 
at the end of the day, the sad thing is that the creator has no control over the interpretation after so, the fact, no matter how so hard they try. We've brought up the the ongoing. Uh, so, Ali, I'm not sure if you know that Matt's uh, the basis for the band Weedus. So, yes. like, we were talking about, like, in past episodes, you know, you can't control how people are going to read the lyrics to Teenage right. Dirtbag one way or the other. All yeah. you can do is is put it out there and sing it. <laughs> but, like, that's that's been an issue from the dawn of creative, like creation with literature, you know, like mm-hmm. you're, you're always up to someone else's interpretation. You can't control how someone takes a piece of media and interprets it. But I'm curious now hearing about that article. I wonder if that um, also explains why people in the weird Al subreddit were so immediately <laughs> aggressive towards the fat question that I, <laughs> uh, yeah. What yeah. was, uh, can I, can you enlighten me on that? So I, we did our episode on fat. And a previous guest had mentioned that they always felt like that song was kind of problematic. So I pitched the question because I'm like, look, I'm not going to pretend that, you know, not that I'm like a supermodel, but I don't think that I'm of a size where I get to determine what is or isn't offensive. Um, So I proposed the question of like, in your eyes, have you ever interpreted this as something that was mean spirited or, or was it more of a song of body positivity just kind of through a very skinny man and most people were kind of on our facebook group people were like super responsive gave us like amazing answers i made the mistake of being like reddit should give us a clear and clean and non-problematic response (laughs) and then i was basically told like i hope one day something innocent that you joked about comes back to bite you in the ass and you have to cut your scrotum off to prove that you're like it was like classic reddit <laughs> response but yeah. i was like Oof. i thought that the like our weird owl page would have been a safe space to ask an innocent weird owl based question <laughs> but sure yeah i mean i don't know so comedy comedy and our political views constantly are evolving and it's it's important to re- of course recognize like when what was the climate when things were made yeah. versus what is the climate now but you could still have conversations you can and should have conversations now yeah. about what would fly today it doesn't and across yeah, yeah, the board like, get a time machine and yeah. <laughs> keep it from Exactly. In, in that episode, across the board, the people who wrote back were like, I was fat my entire life in that video. Seeing a bunch of large dudes doing cartwheels and acting like badasses was empowering to me. So I'm like, <laughs> cool. Like, that's great. That's what I hope the answer is. But it's still worth investigating the question. <laughs> yeah. And, and at the same time, we had said that it's it's that thing of like, like you said, like Al is, is such a wonderful person who you g- generally always know his intentions are pure. But at the same time, it was more like, Despite that, did it ever rub you the wrong way? Did you ever feel funny about it? Yeah. Um, but people, uh, clearly, as Matt found, um, even just the suggestion that someone you love or a song you love could potentially be problematic to anyone is enough to make someone get yeah. very defensive instantly <laughs> and upset at the idea that this thing could... Uh, and you know, for what it's worth, we also said it through the lens. Like Al has not performed fat in a long time, and that's also in large There's part a reason because of there. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's Michael Jackson also plays a big part in that. But, sure. Um, uh, but he still does this song. I mean, this is a, a regular thing for him. I think you know. I don't know. I to me, I always feel like when I hear Al's music, and as you pointed out, he can be really mean mm-hmm. when he is trying to make a point. But I always feel like it's very clear to me where the meanness is being directed and what yeah. he's who he's taking to task and for what. Yes. I've never thought that he was. He doesn't punch down. He doesn't no. punch down exactly and, that. And I mean, look, we've covered what four Al TVs up to this point. There mm-hmm. are some bits on Al TV that don't hold up sure there's you know listen like comedy is like you said it's evolving and you can't but but yeah obviously (laughs) the types of jokes about like you know gay jokes are not going to fly in the same way like Mm -hmm. you know jokes about you know it but you have to look at was it offensive at the time Mm -hmm. and you know in some ways like i feel like you know al's definitely holding up a mirror to society about those types of things and making jokes about it i one of my favorite turns of phrase that i've started to use is just you know this this is an explanation, not an excuse. Like, I love using totally. that to explain yeah. to people stuff where it's like, I love the American Pie movies. They are so special to me because when I was in a junior higher and in high school, like that and Can't Hardly Wait and all of those movies, like that spoke to me. I can still put them on and be like, ooh, <laughs> this, <laughs> totally. this aged like milk, but it still doesn't make me 
not have that same nostalgic feeling that I had as like a 12 year old kid watching it in my basement, like late at night. Cause I didn't want my parents to know I was watching the American pie movies yet. Yeah, like, I don't know, you can't, there, there's something to be said about all that. Yeah. Before we dive into the rankings real quick though, we do have to address the elephant in the room, which is that Allie, you were in fact a, uh, an extra in the award-winning now Weird and Al Yankovic story. Yes, <laughs> yes. Award-winning. They won that award, no small part, thanks to me, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, I messaged Al thanking uh, him, and he said immediately, He, by the way, no one is faster to respond to an email than Weird Al. I don't know how it's possible, but every time I've ever reached out, he gets back in two seconds flat. I've actually heard that before. I have another a friend of mine who's talked to him a bunch over the years and has said the same thing, like, I don't it's know how incredible. he's always always ready to respond. It's incredible. Maybe yeah. it's a chat bot. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I've actually never spoken to Al. Um, yeah, um, he immediately responded saying that I was the best part of the movie. So you know that he's always funny, Aww. even in DMs. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the way that that happened was um, I know Eric Appel, and uh, he had been telling a couple of buddies, including Jonah Ray and myself, about um, how he was about to start production on this movie. And it was super exciting. And so I remembered keeping that in the back of my brain. And when I saw that he was about to start filming, I sent him a message and truly was like, I will do anything at all <laughs> if I could just be on that set. I will mm-hmm. serve coffee. I'll do anything. <laughs> like, And I've met, I've met Al a couple of times. He's always so friendly to me. Um, it was just to see it in action. And I also love Daniel Radcliffe. And so I was very excited. Yeah. Um, I was told that I, I, I still am sometimes told that I look like him. But, but in my middle school experience, <laughs> I was told I look like Daniel Radcliffe on a daily basis. <laughs> and so it was just the perfect combinations of like my childhood loves. Um, and yeah, so he, he put me, um, he threw me a little extra role and it was very funny um <laughs> you're like right I, uh, behind al you're over his i'm right shoulder. behind i'm right behind the real weird al <laughs> and his beautiful wife and um it's very funny um because <laughs> when i watched the movie in the theater for the first time i was can you know i eric had told me that there's no way that they could cut around me because of where they placed me in the audience. So I'm definitely going to be in it. So I was like, okay, thank you so much. That's really cool. But then they kept cutting. I was telling my friend, I'm like, it's so cool. They keep cutting to me. And then my friend's like, no, they're not, you idiot. They're cutting to Al. <laughs> but it, it, I mean, look, this is this is like comedy. This is comedy nerd and like people oh, who are. I love that. I, I feel like we're all. Um, in the most part, the three of us are from that same era where we're all like coming up with the same kind of comedic references of like growing up on the Simpsons and comedy Mm -hmm. bang bang. And like, you know, this, this very unique thing, but watching the movie before I knew that you were an extra in it, that scene happened. And I'm like, Holy shit, that's Ellie Gertz. Oh, Oh, I'm glad that I'm recognizable because I'm not wearing my glasses and I have like Olivia Newton, John end of Greece type of perm. (laughs) 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 And so I wasn't even sure if my own family would recognize me, but I'm really glad. No, right away. And then I not uh, maybe a day or two later, you show shared a screenshot and I was like, I knew it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, that was a, treat i that movie is phenomenal and so like, good growing up on stuff like airplane like it just seems yeah. like it's just the next generation of that type of comedy which more more absurdist comedies please they're so good we um you know we're covering everything in al's uh catalog not just his albums but his tv show appearances all of that on this show and the thing that's been most interesting to us is watching some of the old stuff from the 80s in a post weird the Al Yankovic story lens and how much that movie pulls from like the complete Al DVD set or even like the last five minutes of weird Al's guide to the Grammys like there's so (laughs) many bits and pieces of this stuff that like you can tell the idea of what this biopic is has been just like roasting in his brain since like 85 Amazing. <laughs> it honestly feels now like the culmination of like of all of it it's this incredible yeah. i mean how how amazing for you to have been a part of it like congrats like it's just oh, I, thank I'm, you. I'm uh i'm blown away and i've been just on my own side so happy to see how great the response has been to it because it's a bizarre movie yeah, it's a I movie mean, that could literally be really like out a there cult and, classic later like a uhf like it, like uhf i kind of thought people were going to be like oh this is really just not what i expected at all this is like a goofy silly like a bio of weird al that ends with like a shootout and all these crazy things <laughs> um but people got it like i i don't know like the amount of uh 
praise it's gotten from fans and critics and everybody has made me so happy. Like I, me you too. Know. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a good sign for the world at large really? that yeah. people Truly like is. the Weird Al movie. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Even I have... Well, we need we need more stuff like that because there was a while where you were getting like I don't know. Obviously, like there have been so many things going on with theaters and mm-hmm. just kind of movies in general and just the difference between like are people watching more on TikTok or like does yeah. anyone even watch TV anymore? Sure. Like all these things are playing a part in it, but there just hasn't been like a big space for comedy movies and so to get one and to have it go so well both critically and with fans is very optimistic to me at least absolutely i, I hope that yeah. we get to see more of that well, totally, totally and that's the thing that we've also seen in comedy movies time and time and time again is like you have an animal house and then you have 30 animal houses <laughs> with different names or you have sure. like a 40 year old virgin and then every person who makes a comedy film is making their version of a Judd Aptel comedy film. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I agree with you. Fingers crossed. Like there never really has been this, like there's always been absurdist comedy, right? Like there's always been an airplane or a wet, hot American summer or like, but there's never been like a cluster of like, oh, that was the four years that everyone was making absurdist comedy. Like, <laughs> I would love for us to hit that peak. <laughs> like, Same yeah, here. just live totally. through this thing. Where it's like everything is means nothing. <laughs> I'm in these movies, but they're brilliant. But even just to see people talking about it so much, I mean, how many things come out on Netflix or Hulu now and they're just there and gone instantly? Yeah. And I, I know. know about them because it's people I care about, but it's not like they don't get attention. Like the amount of right. attention this got was just so encouraging. And I know Al is like a fun person for everyone to write about. And he's managed to pull off the thing now where he's been around long enough that any like young to even <laughs> approaching middle-aged uh, writer or or human Yep. Has a has had a phase where they just adored him. So I mean, he is you know he's played the long game, and now he's he's out on top. I love to see it. I love to see it. Iconic. Yeah. Yep. All right, Matt, are you ready to do some quick ranking? Oh, I'm ready. Uh, I I can go first. I've got mine already locked in. I'm I'm putting this bad boy at number two, just beneath "Dare to Be Stupid" for uh, best Al original song. Oh boy, you know Matt, <laughs> you know how much I hate when we agree. <laughs> It's like my least favorite thing. It's so boring when we agree, but I have to agree. I have to agree. I mean, I actually, a part of me is tempted to even put this above Dare to be Stupid. Um, I'm not going to go quite that far just because I feel like that's that song is iconic in a larger way. That I, don't, I don't know if this if this quite can hit that level, but this is, I mean, if we haven't made it clear, this is a flawless pop song. Yeah. This is absolutely flawless. It is so beautifully written and composed and produced everything about it, the musicianship, uh, Steve J's bass line in this song is gr- like, it's just, it's uh, like such a delight to listen to. Um, and if you have someone in your life who's like, Oh, weird Al, he's that guy who makes dumb songs about food. Th- <laughs> if there was any song I would say to like, try to convince someone that there's way more to this guy than they probably realize this is as good an entry point as anything. Yeah. And Allie, you get to participate in the rankings too. Every time that a guest comes on the show, they get to rank the songs that we've had guests on. So what you get to do is A, place Melanie where you think it belongs on this guest rankings, Mm -hmm. but then also you can move one song anywhere else on the list. If you think something's too low or something's too high, you can move it wherever you think it should be. Wow, that's hard. (laughs) I'm surprised to see Eat It kind of smack dab in the middle. Yeah. yeah, there's been some controversial placements. <laughs> God, that's this is really. I wish I had had more time to look at this list because it's really conjuring a lot of emotion in me. Um, <laughs> you should know we've had some people come in here and do insane wow. things. Like, my like, my favorite move was someone who came. In, it was the living with a hernia episode. They showed up put their song at the very bottom of the list and then just move girls want to have lunch to the bottom of the <laughs> list. <laughs> Man, okay. Um, gosh. Uh, well, I I feel like I have to move... Like, I know that Eat It is so popular, obviously, and it's, like, kind of an obvious choice. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, it's like, it's like yesterday where it's yeah, just sure. of the Beatles. It's just kind of like... It's weird to see something like that not topping a list but it's Mm -hmm. also like but it's yesterday you don't want to hear yesterday every single time you listen to the beatles sure but it still just feels so upsettingly (laughs) low it was the first song that i fell in love with of weird al so i feel like i'm gonna move that higher but for now i'm god of these songs uh 
it's and keep in mind, I like we'll always... Melanie. I like Melanie more than literally every song on here. All right, put it we'll at put the top. It at so one. I'm putting it, it. I'm putting yes. it at number one. All right. That's it. And and keep in mind, the movement that you're going to make right now. This is just the first time you're on the show. You've got plenty of other times <laughs> to come back and fuck up this list even more. Yeah. <laughs> and then I also get to make another move. Yeah, you, you get to make, make one it, more you move. Move one thing anywhere you want it. I'm putting eat it after Melanie. All right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, Causing I, some chaos. <laughs> I like that choice a lot. Oh, you know, we talked about like truly eat it is one of those because it's like arguably one of the few Al songs you could maybe say is like you said overplayed a little bit or just everyone sure. knows it so well. But I mean, without the success of eat it, you we're not have, we're not here. We're not yeah. having this conversation. Like that song is like literally a world changing pop pop parody. No one had ever done anything like that before. It's. It is the yeah. most, arguably the most significant song he ever made. Yes, and also I feel like the items that are listed in that song you can't look at without thinking of Eat It. <laughs> I so could, true. I could nary look at an egg without thinking of <laughs> Weird yeah. Al. Or like, Captain Crunch or Raisin <laughs> Bran. Yeah. We've, we've <laughs> mentioned, I think on the episode that we had with Chris, like I genuinely don't think I know all the words to Beat It, but I definitely know oh, definitely every don't. word to eat it <laughs> for, sure, for sure 100%. do not know the words to beat it <laughs> <laughs> i do by the way think it's crazy what i just did to i think it's insane to put melanie above eat it but i also am sticking by it so that Look, is what i'm doing what i'm it. looking forward to the most <laughs> is when you come back on the show a couple more times and you just become known as the person who no matter what just raises melanie to the melanie. top of the list just keep <laughs> melanie to the top. That's great. doesn't matter where you place the song that you're here to talk about just so yeah. long as melanie gets back on that that's top the only spot. reason i'll come back is to make sure melanie's exactly. at the we, we're here to embrace chaos to, yes. we, we still haven't decided what will happen with the guest rankings at the end like when we get to the end of this journey do we just have all of the guests come and argue over the positioning <laughs> or what? Like, I don't know what the end that could be fun. with it, but well, thank you so much, Allie, for joining us. Is there anything that you need to promote or that's coming uh, around the corner that you want to talk about? I don't know if Twitter still exists at this time and place <laughs> uh, or will exist, <laughs> but I'm on everything at Allie Gertz, everything that will exist. I will try it out. I'll give it a college try. Sure. We'll see what happens. But Allie is always the place to get your news for me. Um, and uh, if you haven't already listened to my very weird nine inch nails cover album, uh, look up nine inch nails peeled back. I'm very excited about that guy. Nice. Awesome. Nice. <laughs> You're listening to the Geekscape Network. 